Hi, this is Kessel Fikowski, and in this video we're going to be looking at federalism. So here are the learning objectives that are going to be covered straight from the AP Gov curriculum that has been devised. And so let's first start off with our definition of federalism. Federalism is a system in which the national government shares power with the state and local governments. And it's important to note that the state governments have the authority to make final decisions over main, many governmental actions. So despite the fact that we're going to be giving more power to the national government following the abolishment of the Articles of Confederation, does not mean that states do not have power. In fact, they are going to have a good amount. It's just not going to be as much as before under the Articles of Confederation because we know that that was not practically uh, a good constitution to have as seen by Shays' Rebellion. So the major theme that I want you to keep in mind as we go through this is that the most persistent source of political conflict, even today, is between the national and state governments. It's simply a tug of war as to who has power over what particular issue. And the Constitution, of course, is going to try to you know, set this out, but keep in mind that the framers kept certain things very vague and open-ended because, again, the Constitution is meant to amend itself over time, both formally as well as informally. And of course, we see that more informal change over time rather than formal amendments. So let's look at federalism here. You see that power is divided between the central government or the national government, as well as the state and local government. And they both act upon the citizen, right? We have national laws, we have state laws, we have local laws. So again, power is dispersed, it is shared. It may not be equally shared. For example, in this case, it is not equally shared because the national government is going to be supreme over the state government. But again, just to stress this, does not mean that the state government doesn't have any power. So some examples, of course, being the United States as well as Canada. So what are some advantages to federalism? Well, there are actually quite a few. It decentralizes our politics. For example, there are more opportunities to participate. Keep in mind, in all 50 states, a total of 87,000 different governments exist. That includes Board of Education, that includes Town Council, that includes the mayors, that includes state governments, and, and etc. Right? So this gives people, ordinary people, the opportunity to participate. Your mom or dad might have been the local mayor. Well, that allows, thanks to federalism, for our politics to be decentralized and allows for ordinary people to participate in our democracy. It's also important because it separates powers at different levels, not just different branches. You're typically going to associate separation of powers with the legislative, the judicial, and the executive branch, which is correct. But with, uh, in the context of federalism, we're talking about separating power between the national and the state governments. It also decentralizes our policies. For example, states act as laboratories. They will solve the same problem in different ways and tend to be policy innovators so that states will experiment with something and if it works out well, they'll share it with the other 49 states to utilize in their states should that be a good solution for them. And then lastly, federal and state governments handle different problems in terms of regulating drinking ages, although that is a whole other story, marriage, speed limits, education. So again, they handle different problems in different ways and again, these are some good advantages of federalism. So what is the basis of federalism? Well, we know through the supremacy clause of Article 6 of the Constitution, it states that the following are supreme over the states. Namely, the U.S. Constitution is the supreme law of the land. Following that, we have acts of treaties and Congress. And then you have state constitutions, state laws, and city and county ordinances. So basically what this means is that let's say the city ordinance said that skateboarding is illegal everywhere in the city. But let's say that this, you know, the U.S. Constitution, or, um, and we'll say Amendment 28, says that skateboarding is allowed wherever somebody wants to. Well, because this is the hierarchy, that the U.S. Constitution is the highest law, supreme law of the land, that means that the Constitution automatically trumps the city and county ordinance. So despite the fact that they made that ordinance, it is no longer going to be existence theoretically or cannot be in existence because the U.S. Constitution says otherwise. So this is the pecking order in terms of laws from the lowest to the highest level. Now, it's important to note that although the U.S. Constitution, laws of Congress, and treaties are supreme, it does not mean that state powers are gone. It does not mean that the national government 
can usurp these powers. And why? Well, that comes right out of the Bill of Rights in our 10th Amendment, which states that the powers not given to the national government are given to the states. So if it's not given directly to the national government, the states now have control over that. For example, education. So one issue, though, and again, this is a good example of the major theme between the power of the national government and the states sort of being in a tug of war, tend to be with cannabis or marijuana. If you look on this map, you'll see that the areas in green, light green, dark green, uh, the middle shade of green, all have some type of marijuana. However, if you know anything about marijuana laws, the national government actually outlaws it, yet the states have it. So using this hierarchy, you, you should be saying to yourself, wait, the act of Congress that makes it illegal at the federal level, but the states are making it legal, that shouldn't be because this is higher. And you would actually be correct. What the states are doing is basically not following the supremacy clause. And that certainly could be challenged. There have been actually issues, uh, especially under former President George Bush, where he instructed the DEA to raid medical marijuana shops. Even though it was legal in California in terms of their state law, it's still illegal at the federal level. So even if you are hypothetically utilizing marijuana in any of these states that allows it, whether it's for medicinal purposes or recreational purposes, you are still breaking the federal law and you could theoretically be arrested for that. So certainly a very sticky issue indeed. So let's move on here. In terms of the Constitution's di distribution of powers, as we said that there are going to be gov uh, powers given directly to the national government, as you see here, powers given both to the national government and the state government here, and powers given just to the state governments. And then at the same time, you have powers denied by the Constitution to the national government, as well as to the states and national government, and then specific powers denied just to the states. So the Constitution is very specific in that regard as to some of the powers that are granted to each level of the national and state governments. And again, if you look at some of these other powers here um, given directly to the national government and uh, powers given to both of them, and then again, powers given just to the states, there you have them. So the names for these powers are delegated and enumerated powers. These are powers granted exclusively to the national government, such as declaring war. And that makes sense on a number of different levels. In particular, let's say the state of New Jersey was upset with the country of Morocco and it decided to, to declare war. That would be a big problem if, let's say, Virginia and North Carolina and the rest of the other 49 states were not on board. You can't just have certain states declaring war on another country or ratifying treaties. That's why these powers are given just to the national government. And indeed, that these powers here are called um, your delegated and your enumerated powers. Next, you have concurrent powers. And here you have these are powers shared by both the national and the state governments. So again, both the national and state governments raise taxes, right? So your state might have an income tax. Your state might have some type of sales tax. Uh, whatever it might be, these are powers shared by both the national and the state governments. And then the last one here being reserved powers, powers granted exclusively to the states. And that includes establishing local governments, establishing and maintaining schools, conducting elections, etc. So again, those are reserve powers. If you recall, this comes directly from the 10th Amendment. All right, moving on here. So here are three other learning objectives straight from the AP Gov curriculum. And over time, it's important to note that national power, in particular the power of the federal government, over the states has steadily increased over time through implied powers. If something is implied, that means it's not explicit, it's not overt, it's interpreted. And one of the earliest issues and game changers, if you will, which leads to the growth of the national government is included in what's called the Elastic Clause. The Elastic Clause means that the Congress can do anything that it deems necessary and proper. In 1819, in the case of McCulloch v. Maryland, and I would pay attention to this case because this is one of your foundational cases that you're going to need to know for the AP Gov exam, the state of Maryland was trying to tax the Bank of the United States, which happened to be situated in Maryland. Well, Congress is, I'm sorry, the Supreme Court rather, is going to rule that having a national bank was necessary to carry out Congress's power to tax. And as a result, Maryland is no longer able to tax the bank. 
Why this is important is because it allows Congress to do anything that's necessary and proper. That's very vague. What is necessary and proper? That's going to vary depending on who you ask. And that, again, is going to significantly expand the power of the national government. You could ask yourself in contemporary times, is it necessary and proper for the United States to have universal health care? You're going to have a lot of people saying yes, you're going to have a lot of people saying no. Again, you can see how easily that can be debated as well as interpreted. Another important case that I'm going to mention to you is Gibbons v. Ogden in 1824. And this establishes the Commerce Clause, which allows Congress to have the power of interstate commerce. Why this is important, and the details of this case aren't particularly important, but it involves steamboats and ships. But what the, why this is important is that anything that crosses state lines, Congress can now regulate. That's why, for example, Congress can regulate airwaves and regulate airplanes, right? They cross state boundaries. So as a result, Congress has the power to do so. And in, in, in this ruling, in these two cases within five years of each other, significantly expand what Congress can control in terms of commerce and in terms of really what's anything is necessary and proper. Okay, so moving on here too, uh, it's important to note that there's this term known as selective incorporation, and then we're going to get more into this when we get into the civil rights aspects of this, but the 14th Amendment establishes indirectly what's called selective incorporation. Originally, the Bill of Rights only applied to the federal government, but not the state governments, and this comes out of the case of Barron v. Baltimore. Now, each aspect of the Bill of Rights has to be slowly incorporated into the states over time. And this is important because this helps to expand, extend the civil rights at the state level over time as well. So again, what selective incorporation means is that each aspect of the Bill of Rights, or First Ten Amendments, is going to slowly over time be incorporated into the state governments, meaning that the states can now are going to have to abide by the Bill of Rights. One of the reasons why this was the case is that it was assumed at the time of the drafting of the Constitution that the states would already have these, you know, something similar to freedom of speech, but not every state actually did. So again, over time, through selective incorporation, the amendments and aspects of it are going to be extended to the states. But originally, the Bill of Rights only applied to the federal and not the state governments. So while the national government has expanded in its power over time, there it was a major check on national power, and this comes in a case in 1995 called U.S. v. Lopez, in which the national government attempts to regulate a gun-free zone using the Commerce Clause. Think about that for a second. The Commerce Clause and gun-free school zones. Does that make sense? Does the Commerce Clause have anything to do with regulating gun-free school zones? Well, of course, this goes all the way up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court says, well, this was power unchecked by the national government and that the national government cannot use the Commerce Clause for unrelated matters that don't have anything to do with the Commerce Clause. So this was a major check on the national government as well as a major win for the state government. So again, notice that the states and the national government are always in that metaphoric tug of war. So here you see with McCulloch v. Maryland and Gibbons v. Ogden, these are definitely uh, major wins from the national government, which expand its power. However, U.S. v. Lopez checks that power in 1995 and sort of puts the national government a little bit more into its place. All right, so it's important to know as well that states do have obligations to each other under federalism. Well, you have what's called the full faith and credit clause that each state must recognize official documents and judgments rendered by other states. That means that if you get married in New Jersey, it has to be recognized in California. Then you also have the Privileges and Immunities Act, meaning that citizens of each state have privileges of citizens of other states. So if I'm a resident of New Jersey and I go into Pennsylvania, they cannot treat me differently. With respect to extradition, if I commit murder in Pennsylvania and I live in New Jersey, New Jersey has an obligation to the state of Pennsylvania to basically extradite me and for me to face punishment for such a crime. All right, we will leave it there with our discussion of federalism, and we'll continue in part two looking at fiscal federalism. Be sure to check that out. Thanks for listening.